Hi, my name is Gary Shiner and I'll be the presenter for the first session and I'll be introducing uh, two excellent speakers in the afternoon as well. Uh, Cliff Sherb is going to be talking about uh, fitness gadgetry, all of the you know, different tools and things we have available to help us with training. And then John Walsh is going to be discussing what's new in insulin pump therapy and, and what's on the horizon. So we got some really good material uh, to present for you in this technology room. Uh, I'm a diabetes educator based in Philadelphia and I happen to work with a great team of other CDEs and everyone on my team has type 1 diabetes. I'm not exactly an equal opportunity employer when it comes to that. <laughs> People are always sending me messages like, are you looking for staff? And I always have to kind of skirt around the idea, so how did you develop your interest in this? And you know, what's your, do you have a personal link of some kind? And I guess I could get in trouble with the government for asking those kind of things, but I don't know. I think people with diabetes get it better than people who don't have it. So um, I've had diabetes now for 28 years, diagnosed in Sugarland, Texas, of all places. <laughs> and you saw in the back, a couple of my books are back there. Think Like a Pancreas is probably the book I'm best known for. And I was recently honored by the Association of Diabetes Educators as Educator of the Year for the upcoming year. This is the first time that an exercise physiologist has been issued that award. And after you know, so many years of diabetes education being in existence, I think it says something about the need for people in our type of field. So question for all of you. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you currently use a continuous glucose monitor? Okay, hands down. How many of you have not used one before and don't, uh, or haven't used one at all? Anybody here who's never used one? Anybody who's used the CGM and gave up on it? A couple of people. Okay, so the majority of you are using CGM. Let me ask you, what don't you like about them? What doesn't work so well on your CGM? Anyone have a comment about that? Anything about it you don't like? Yeah. I can't totally trust it. Can't totally trust it. Slow. All right. So the numbers aren't always accurate, reliable. Well, slow. they're slow to respond. Okay. They don't catch up with blood sugar changes immediately. That's right. I'm overwhelmed by the information sometimes. Scott is overwhelmed by the information. All right, he gets overwhelmed easily, but <laughs> nah, that's, that's the, most physicians get overwhelmed with the data as well, so you're not alone in that regard. Um, I forget to turn my uh, low alarm lower when I go to bed, so I get awakened. You get awakened by alarms that you didn't really want. Okay, uh, I still remember uh, there was a system called the Navigator uh, that Abbott made. Anybody remember that one? It was a good continuous glucose monitor. They didn't continue supporting it in the U.S. and they pulled it from the market though. My wife didn't call it the navigator. She called it the abstinator because it would always go off right in the heat of the moment. <laughs> we tried sticking it between the mattress and the box spring. It would be vibrating and beeping. We couldn't shut that thing down. So, yeah, these, these systems have their drawbacks. Is anybody having to pay out of pocket for their, their supplies or their system? or at least has a copay with, with their supplies. It's, it's not cheap. You know, it's, it's expensive stuff. Does anybody get false alarms on their systems? Yeah. All right, so there's a lot of things about it that aren't so good. What we're going to focus on today is how we can make more effective use of the systems. And what we're going to cover, we'll start just a few minutes on basics about the various systems so those of you who are not familiar with them can get up to speed. We'll discuss how we make effective use of the immediate information that a CGM provides us. Also what we can do with downloaded data, looking back at historical information and how we can use that to our advantage. And if we have time at the end we'll discuss a little bit about how to get the systems to function as well as possible. We have a couple of systems available now. In the United States, there are only two systems that are FDA approved, the Dexcom and the Medtronic. Uh, the Dexcom system, we had the, the Dexcom 7 Plus for many years, and recently the Dexcom G4 system, their newest one, came out. And the other system is from Medtronic, and Medtronic has one type of sensor and one type of transmitter, but they have a few different ways of seeing the data. One way is with a system uh, called Guardian that just serves as a display for the information. Now what does that look like? Looks like a pump. 
It smells like a pump. It's not a pump though. It just displays the sensor information. The other way we can get sensor data is on their pump screen. So one of the neat things about Medtronic sensor is you don't have to carry around or wear a separate device to see your information. It will display right on the pump screen. Every continuous monitor has three components. There's a sensor which is about the size of a piece of tinsel. It's a metallic filament. It's typically made of platinum. And that filament is inserted below the skin into the subcutaneous fat layer. Kind of like the way a pump infusion set gets inserted. There's an introducer needle that pops it in, the needle's retracted, and it leaves the little metallic filament under the skin. Attached to that little filament is a transmitter. Uh, both Medtronic and Dexcom have a transmitter. You know, Dexcom's looks like a chiclet. It's an expensive chiclet though. And Medtronic's looks like a kind of a half dollar. It's sort of roundish. And those attach to the platform that holds the sensor under the skin. And the transmitter sends a signal to a display or a pump or whatever's going to provide you with your information. So those are the three parts to any continuous monitor. The download systems that work for both provide a variety of different reports. There are statistical reports, there are graphic reports, uh, there's one that we call a, a spaghetti or a modal day report that just superimposes multiple days of data. Medtronic's sensors download to a web-based program called CareLink. And CareLink is pretty easily shareable with healthcare providers as long as they have your username and access code. I work with thousands of people worldwide and they're able to download their data, we're able to access it pretty easily just by looking at it online. Medtronic, excuse me, Dexcom downloads to a PC only based program called Studio. And Studio generates similar reports, but it's not as easily shareable. It is shareable though. The data can be packaged in a single file and emailed. So we have clients sending us their email files that we can then import and look at. The types of reports these generate though are very similar. You get similar types of information from the downloads. What do we get in real time? day-to-day -day living with a continuous monitor. Right? There's three things we get. We get numbers. The continuous monitors will update every five minutes with a number on screen. We get alerts, high and low alerts, letting us know if we're getting out of, out of our desired range. And we get trending information. I'd like to have people assign a grade. Those of you who are experienced CGM users, let's assign a grade to each of those in terms of the reliability, usefulness, etc. The number that shows up on screen, what grade would you give that information? B, A, B minus, C, C, I heard a C plus. It's a mixture, and I think it's improved recently, particularly with the Dexcom G4. The accuracy of the numbers has improved quite a bit. Historically, I would hear C's. Whether it was a Medtronic or a Dexcom, the Dexcom 7 Plus, eh, we'd C, C Plus, uh, because the information was only so-so eh, in terms of reliability. But what about the alerts, the high and low alerts? What grade would you give those for their reliability and usefulness? Got A, A minus, heard a few Bs. That's typical. It's in that A to B range. How about the trending information? If it shows you rising or dropping, how reliable is that information? A. Yeah, that's, there's a consensus there. <laughs> yeah, you can bet the, the mortgage on that. If it shows you rising, you're rising. And if it shows you dropping, you're dropping. Because the sensor data is just relevant, it's related to the previous set of five minutes of data that it collected. If the signal coming from that sensor is going up, your sugar's rising. You can bet on that. And likewise, if it's dropping. So looking at the numbers, the FDA approves these things if the numbers are within 20% on average of lab values. Um, and if your blood sugar is below 80, if it's within 20 points, same thing. So you know, these systems can reach the marketplace without being terribly accurate. So at least until recently, these numbers were ballpark estimates. And it, it has changed with the latest Dexcom system. 
Uh, I will say the Medtronic sensor is still the same old sensor. You know, they can kind of disguise it with new algorithms, new display properties, but the sensor still eh, it leaves a little to be desired in terms of the precision. You know, statistically, they're typically within about 16, 17 percent of the lab values that are taken at the same time. Medtronic has a new sensor called Enlight that is available in Europe, Australia, different parts of the world. I've used the Enlight. I've had patients use it. It's marginally better than the sensors, the soft sensors that Medtronic has now, not significantly. The Dexcom system has become significantly better. You know, we're going from a 16 to about an 11 percent variance compared to lab values. And in fact, I'll tell you something about this number. On day one with a Dexcom sensor, we're looking at about a 15, 16 percent error. From day two onward, and those of you who use Dexcom knows that that onward can go on for quite a while, <laughs> we're looking at about a 9 percent average variance from the lab values. 9 percent. Consider this, there are a lot of blood glucose meters on the market that are less accurate than that. All right, so from an accuracy standpoint, there's been a lot of improvement. And eventually, I'm pretty sure Medtronic will catch up with that as well. But at least with Dexcom right now, we've got a system that's on par with a lot of the blood glucose meters we use. It's more accurate than some meters, but ironically, we still have to calibrate it with a blood glucose meter. Both systems require calibration at least two or three times a day. You know, three times a day seems to be uh, optimal for most people. So can the numbers themselves be trusted? When you look at your continuous glucose monitor and it says you're 175, should you take that number and act upon it? Should you dose based on it? Should you eat based on it? The answer is sometimes. It's like anything in diabetes. It's not an exact science. We have to interpret. Now, I would say that anyone who's new to continuous monitoring, the first couple of sensors you wear, you're really just learning the system and getting a better understanding. I would not trust the numbers the first couple of times you put a sensor in. And even after you get experienced with it, the first day or so that a sensor is in, it's not going to be that reliable. Until you've done several calibrations and they start matching up pretty well, I wouldn't trust it then either. Another time it's not as trustworthy is when the glucose levels are rising or falling quickly. And that's because of something called lag, lag time. You alluded to it before. The sensors take a little bit of time to catch up with changes in your blood sugar. So if right now your blood sugar is climbing from breakfast, your sensor is going to read a little bit lower than your finger stick would because the sensor is ta it, it's about 10 to 15 minutes behind what your actual blood sugar is. You remember, the sensor is not in a blood vessel, it's in the fatty layer. So when your blood sugar changes, it takes time for that change in glucose concentration to make its way into the fatty layer. And even then, the sensor is collecting data for five minutes and averaging it and giving you a data point then. So that adds to the lag time. So when glucose levels are rising fast, the sensor is going to be underestimating your blood sugar. And when it's dropping fast, it's going to overestimate your blood sugar. So that's another source of error. But if things are reasonably stable, if your sugars aren't changing radically, if you didn't just put your sensor in, yeah, usually you can trust it. I haven't seen people run into serious problems doing that. How about the alerts, the high and low alerts? Now, we have a few different definitions for these. You know, the basic high-low alert, we tell it, all right, if I'm above this number, let me know. If I'm below this number, let me know. And with those, we have to balance those settings, uh, the value of them against the nuisance they can create. Now, it used to be people would go on a sensor and we would automatically put their low at 70, their high at 160, 180. They'd be going off constantly. I mean, they're just beeping and buzzing all the time. And it gets to a point where you just say, screw it, I'm not even paying attention anymore. And a lot of people would give up on their systems because of that. So we have to, we'll talk in a minute about what would be better settings to use. Uh, the Medtronic system has something called a predictive alert. This is not in the Dexcom system. The predictive alert simply means that if your blood sugar is rising and if it continues on that same trajectory, you're going to hit your high alert in a certain period of time. You might set it for 15 minutes or 10 minutes. And the same thing with a low. 
If it continues on its current trajectory, it's going to hit that low point in 10, 15 minutes. But how often does blood sugar stay on its current trajectory? If you look at your sensor data, it's wiggling around, it's moving every place. It's not that predictable. So if you are going to use a predictive alert, set a very short time interval, five, maybe 10 minutes. I wouldn't go longer than that. Both systems also offer a rate of change alarm. If your glucose is rising very fast, dropping very fast, it can alert you. Now, after we eat meals, it's going to rise fast almost every time. Do you need to know? I don't think so. I, don't, I wouldn't want to know because it's going to come down once the, your bolus insulin kicks in. But the fall rate is certainly useful for people who are trying to prevent hypoglycemia. So I don't know about you, if my sugar is 130 but dropping fast, I'm probably going to need to eat to prevent a low. So that's just our own interpretation of the information. The true value of high and low alerts is to keep our blood sugars within our target range more often. Right? My target range, I like to be between 70 and 160. I'm comfortable. That's my happy zone. And everyone has their happy zone where you like your blood sugar to be. By using the high and low alerts, we can keep ourselves in that range more often. So let me explain this weird looking graph. If you're not using a continuous monitor and your blood sugar is climbing, you're probably not going to feel any differently at 180 or 200 than you do at 120. I mean, we just don't, it doesn't trigger any unusual symptoms. We might start feeling differently up around 300. And if we fix it at that point and start to bring it down, we spend a lot of time in a high range. We expose our body to a lot of high glucose. But if we're using a sensor that alerts us at, say, 200, and we fix it then, we spend less time in a high range. I think of it as turning mountains into molehills. You're exposing your body to far less high glucose. And the same principle applies at low levels. How many of you feel blood sugars that are 70? Maybe 10%. Right? How many of you feel blood sugars that are 60? Maybe 25%? 50? About half. I mean, this, this is an audience particularly prone to this. Probably everyone in this room has some degree of hypoglycemia unawareness. We don't feel our lows until they're really, really, really low. And even then, the symptoms are not usually the shaking, sweating type symptoms. It's more cognitive. Our brain's just not functioning right. We're behaving strangely. We feel funny. So that's the value here. If you wait until you feel low, you're probably 42, and you fix it, you end up spending a lot of time in a low range, and that's dangerous. The research has shown that you're more likely to have a severe low, where you lose consciousness or have a seizure, if you spend a long time in a low range. You could drop to 40, come right back up, you'll be fine. You could drop to 60. If you stay there a few hours, there's a good chance you'll lose consciousness from that. It's the length of the low that's dangerous, not necessarily how low you get. So the whole idea here. We're reducing the magnitude and duration of the time we spend out of range when we use the high and low alerts. Or I think of it like bumper blood sugars. Anyone been bowling and see they put the bumpers up sometimes for the kids or maybe the adults? I don't know. <laughs> it, what happens is before the ball goes in the gutter, it bounces off and keeps going. And that's kind of like what you can do with a sensor. Instead of going up to 300 and down to 40, maybe you go up to 180 or 200 and then bounce off. Maybe go down to 80 or 70 and bounce off. You keep yourself on the alley or you keep yourself in your target zone a lot more of the time. And look how happy that kid is. You could be that way too. <laughs> However, if you're using high and low alerts, it's very important that you respond to them. They're there for a reason. If you just say, all right, I'm high or I'm low and don't act on it, it's not, you're not doing any good. So when you get those alerts, let's say if you're using the Medtronic system, I would recommend doing a finger stick. If you're doing it using a Dexcom system and it's been working well and it's calibrating well, act on that number. Either bolus if you're high or take a snack if it's dropping low. Ideally, you'll take insulin on board into account. And most pumps nowadays do that. How many here are on injections? 
All right, a decent number, maybe 15, 20%. You can learn how to, use, how to calculate your own insulin on board. There's a few ways to do that. I mean, you can just calculate it you know, manually, figuring a certain percentage of your insulin is used up per hour. And there's an app called Pancreum uh, that does that as well. But you know, that, that's, that's important. If you're going to act on high readings between meals, you have to consider the insulin that's still working from the previous meal. And this proven benefit of the, having the low alert feature turned on, and this was done 10 years ago with older systems that were much less accurate than what we have now. But what they found is that the time people spend in a hypoglycemic range is cut in half when they get the alert that they're low as soon as they hit 70 in this case. So by doing that, you spend half as much time in a hypoglycemic range. Otherwise, you're waiting until you feel low and then you act on it. You end up spending a lot more time low. The chances of losing consciousness or having a seizure go way up. Now the third thing we talked about was the trend information, rising and falling blood sugars. And I happened to grab these screenshots off uh, from some online websites. And it, it really looked good because they both showed the same blood sugar of 128, but in one case the glucose is dropping and in one case it's rising. Right? And in your own, and you think about in your own life, if you're about to drive, if you're about to take an exam, if you're about to work out, if you're about to play any sport or do anything that requires you to have your wits about you, it's important to know not just where your blood sugar is but where it's going. So if you're about to go to bed at night, your blood sugar is 100, you do the happy dance. But what if it's 100 and falling fast? What would you do? You'd eat. What if it's 100 and starting to climb? Now, you might check it again a little while later, but you'd act differently. You know, knowing if you're rising or falling does make a big difference. We recommend to our clients that they adjust their bolus or mealtime insulin doses based on the direction blood sugar is headed. If you're going into a meal, let's say we go into lunch today and your blood sugar is stable, taking your normal dose, what you need for your food and your blood sugar, should work. But if you're going into lunch and your blood sugar is dropping pretty quickly, and you take the dose for that blood sugar at that moment in time and the food you're eating, you're probably going to wind up too low within the next few hours. Likewise, if you're going up and you take your standard dose, you're going to wind up higher than you wanted to be in a few hours. So what we recommend is adjusting the bolus doses just a little bit based on the direction blood sugars are headed. Pumps don't know this. They don't know what direction you're going. Only you know this from your continuous monitor. So you could add, and I base it on the number of arrows on screen. Both Medtronic and Dexcom show trend arrows. You know, one up arrow means you're rising at a reasonably fast pace. Two up arrows, you're rising very quickly. So tack on enough insulin to offset about a 25 point rise if you got one up arrow, and enough to offset a 50 point rise if you have two up arrows. So let's say your correction factor is 30. One unit drops you 30 points. If you got one up arrow, you might want to add about 0.7 or 0.8. If you got two up arrows, you'd add, what, about 1.6, 1.7. So you can individualize that based on your own situation. And again, if you're dropping, deduct the insulin. Take away enough insulin to offset that much of a drop. That will put you in your target range more often. Mathematically, it works very nicely, and in real life, it works nicely, too. Another way we can use trending information is in how we treat our lows. We all know we, there are lows and there are lows. We've had lows that don't want to come up. And those are the kind of lows that are not only low, but they're accelerating downward. We must have a lot of insulin on board that's still dropping us quickly. Or our body is very sensitive to insulin, maybe from exercise. So in cases like that, we have to treat the low more aggressively. We need more food. And we've got to make sure we're using food that works very, very quickly. But then there are cases like this where we're just mildly low. Maybe something we ate earlier is just starting to digest. A case like this, we can be much more conservative in our treatment of a low. We can use less food, and we may not need to use something that works very, very fast. Just a small amount of carbs might be all that's needed. In some cases, you may not even have to treat this at all. 
if you know from experience that you know this is going to produce another 40 or 50 point rise for you that kind of a waveform you may not have to eat anything so knowing how the best way to treat a low it's good to look at your sensor data now what about the historical information and this is something that I, I I've developed kind of a specialty in. We have clients who aren't really clients of ours. All they do is send us their sensor data and our team will analyze it and come up, look for the patterns and come up with recommendations. There's a lot you can learn from continuous monitor data. But before you do so, before you look at your own data, there are a few things you need to do. You've got to make sure that you're calibrating enough. The reliability of the data, the accuracy, depends on timely calibrations. This is the food that nourishes your continuous monitor. And if you're not feeding it sufficiently, it's not going to function as well. You also want to look to see if the calibrations matched the sensor data reasonably well. If there were constantly big discrepancies, the data is not going to be reliable. And, and was the information continuous? If it was intermittent, if there's big gaps between data, again, it's not going to be as useful. And this is one I threw on at the last minute. Make sure the time and date on your sensor are set right. Mm -hmm. I did a full analysis on a teenager's data one time and just found out the AM and PM were flipped. <laughs> I, was, I was livid. Like, couldn't you have told me that from the beginning? When you're looking at sensor data that you've downloaded, do not, do not go into it with an open mind. <laughs> Trust me, if you go into it with an open mind, and Scott, this is for you. You go into it with an open mind, you will get overwhelmed. I will get overwhelmed, all right? The most brilliant minds in the country, IBM Big Blue Computer, will get overwhelmed. There's so much there. Go into it with an agenda. Go into it with ideas of, this is what I want to look for. Like for one thing, you can look to see if your mealtime insulin doses are the right amounts. And I'll show you examples of these in just a minute. You can also see if the, the correction doses are doing the job properly. You can evaluate how long it takes your bolus insulin to work. Everyone who wears a pump puts that information into their pump. It goes into your bolus calculator. It always asks, how long does your insulin work for? So what do you put in? Just pick a number out of your butt and you stick it in there, right? There's no, there's no rhyme or reason, you just put a number in. But we can see exactly how long the boluses take on these sensors. We can evaluate the post-meal peaks. How much of a spike is taking place after meals? Sensors, continuous monitors are great for fine-tuning basal insulin. And basal is the foundation of the whole program, so it's important to get that set right. You can determine if you're having lows at times you don't even detect them. And you can also see if the treatment is appropriate. You can see how different forms of exercise and sports are impacting your blood sugar. This requires use of either event markers in your CGM or some form of record keeping so that you can document the workouts that you're doing. Does anybody here use Simlin? A couple. Anyone here use a GLP-1 like Victoza, Bayetta, Bidurion? A couple do. All right. The, uh, we're going to see more and more use of these. These are medications that supplement things that we're deficient in as type 1 diabetics. And they help to suppress appetite. They slow digestion. They blunt the unusual glucagon responses that we get at times. So for people who are using these, the CGMs help us to get the doses titrated. And then there are all the lifestyle events, the cause-effect relationships that we can learn by looking at the sensor data. As far as the reports, there are three reports that I like to look at. You know, Medtronic has uh, eight or ten sensor reports, and so does Dexcom. Some of them I don't find useful at all. But I do like looking at the statistical reports, the modal day or the spaghetti reports, and then some of the individual day stuff. Now, some of the statistics I find really useful. One is simply looking at the average blood sugar. Why? Well, it's a nice way to compare from time A to time B if things have improved. And you can also derive your A1C pretty darn closely from your sensor data. If you take a month or more of sensor data and look at the average, you can convert that to your A1C. You want to know the formula? Yeah. All right. 
I'm only going to say this once, so write it down. All right, if you take the average off of your sensor and multiply it by 1.03, add 3% to it. And the reason is that sensors underestimate blood sugars a little bit overall. This will give you a truer average. Now you take that true average, add 46.7, Seriously. And then divide by 28.7. And that should give you your A1C. And it should come within a few tenths of a point of what the lab gives you. Next time you go to your doctor, bet them on what your A1C is going to be. Go double or nothing on your copay and see how you do. <laughs> well. A1C and average blood sugar are statistics, and you can lie with statistics. You can be very misleading. Lots and lots of people have decent averages, nice A1Cs, but their control is horrible because they're bouncing up and down, up and down all the time. You can have lots of highs and lots of lows and have a decent average. That doesn't mean you have quality management. The gold standard for me is the percentage of time you spend within your target range. If you've got a very high percentage of time in your target range, you're doing well. I like to see less than 5% of the time below the target range. If you take your sensor data and you've got 10% of your time below your target, that's an average of two and a half hours a day in a hypoglycemic range. That's not good. All right. And for most people, if we can get 70, 75% of the time in range, that's pretty nice. You can beat that, you're really doing a good job. As far as variability, two numbers we look at are standard deviation, which the systems will give you, and something called coefficient of variance. That's simply your standard deviation divided by your average. So if your average is 150 and your standard deviation is 75, that means your coefficient of variance is 50%. I like the coefficient of variance to be less than a third of the average. That means the blood sugars are fairly stable. You're not hitting extreme highs and lows very often. Things are in the middle most of the time. You can also get a, a readout of the number of times you've gone above and below your target thresholds. And just quantifying those from week to week, month to month, it allows you to track your progress, particularly the lows. Now, how many times did you go below your low threshold in a week or a month and see how that compares to the last time you looked at it? So let's look at a few case studies. This is a type 1 patient who's on multiple injection therapy, only checking their blood a couple of times a day. And they have pretty decent fasting readings, but their A1C is elevated, and that's because they're just missing the rest of the day. The sensor is a very good way of showing what's going on the rest of the day. We got pretty high blood sugars going on after breakfast. We got a snack in the afternoon that's producing highs before dinner. And we got highs after dinner as well. So this person probably needs to be doing a better job matching their insulin to their food at breakfast, at snack, and at dinner. Lunch doesn't look like much of a problem. They tend to come down to normal, maybe even a little low, around that 3, 4 o'clock time frame. Here's a 34-year-old pump user. In the morning, they're covering their breakfast and their blood sugar with a bolus. Same thing at lunchtime, same thing at dinner. Now the breakfast and lunch doses are clearly too low. They're not getting enough insulin to cover what they're eating because all that dose is doing is holding them steady. The extra insulin they're giving for the high reading is just barely covering what the food is. So they need more insulin to cover breakfast and lunch. If they're doing a carb ratio of one to 10, maybe they need a one unit per eight or one unit per seven grams at breakfast and lunch. But what about dinner? Dinner's working. And if there's one thing in diabetes that we know, if it ain't broke, we don't mess with it. There's enough that we can adjust. The dinner dose here is working very nicely. And then we've got a night nice snack where the problems are starting all over again. Now interestingly, look what's going on at night. This person has blood sugar in the low to mid 200s straight through the night. What does that mean about their basal insulin at night? Too low. Hmm. I'm not going to answer it. We're going to talk about that later. 
Here's a five-year-old boy on multiple injection therapy. He's using Levomir twice a day and gets mealtime insulin. Overall, not doing too badly, but in the evening, we've got a problem. After dinner, we got lots of low blood sugar. Now, the sensor readouts put each day in a different color. So all I have to do is count the number of colors I see down here, and I know how many days he had a low. We got a green, an orange, a blue, a red, there's a yellow, so we got five out of seven days. This kid was low after dinner. So clearly, there's a need to reduce the dinner time insulin. Uh, here's a teenager that stays up kind of late playing video games, watching TV, and the blood sugar in the evening is going up pretty high. And, and this, there are a host of things that could be causing that. Most likely, there's some snacking going on at night, kind of grazing right through the evening. So we need to talk to this kid about structuring the snacks a little bit better, or at least covering what he's eating with an appropriate dose of insulin. Now here's a correction dose gone awry. Middle of the night, somebody woke up, or maybe their sensor alerted them that their blood sugar was over 250, so they corrected, and by the morning, their blood sugar was down to 60. How many of you find that a correction dose brings you down more at nighttime than it does during the day? I see that in uh, almost two thirds of the clients I work with. It does it for me. You know, I assume a unit during the day will drop me 40, but if I do that at night, I'll be low. I have to assume a 60 point drop at night. And it has to do with the interplay of hormone levels while we're sleeping. But a lot of people need a more conservative correction formula at nighttime than they use during the day. And this is, that's the case for this person as well. And what about the post-meal blood sugars? Most of us don't do finger sticks an hour, hour and a half after we eat. That's usually when blood sugars hit their high point, 60 to 90 minutes post-meal. So this was a young adult with type 1 who had pretty decent blood sugar going into meals, but they were topping out in the 300 range after meals on a consistent basis, and, and that's not good. There are a lot of problems that post-meal spikes cause for us. You know, not just affecting A1C levels, but how we feel and how we perform on a daily basis. You know what it feels like. It just doesn't feel good to be going up and then plummeting and up and plummeting. You know, half the time you feel tired, half the time you feel like you're low. It's not a good way to be. And there's growing evidence that variability like this has a detrimental effect on our blood vessels. So there's an emphasis now on trying to stabilize blood sugars more often. So we got peak, peak, peak. What's something that could be done to fix this? Anyone have an idea? Paul? I just, uh, back a little bit, I was going to say, what about Simulin? Yeah, Simulin is one of the things that can help stabilize this. It really slows down digestion a lot. I mean, there are side effects with Simulin, nausea, et cetera, but once you get past that, it's one of the more potent tools for managing these post-meal peaks. And in fact, that's exactly what we recommended for this person. Because right? they had already been doing some of the other things that can help manage the post meals. So going on Simlin was the answer for them. This is a pump user who's bolusing their insulin right before they eat. And one thing we asked them about dinner time is what they were eating. They're usually having potatoes. Most of the day, we don't have big spikes after the meals. But dinner time, a lot of nights, they're spiking up really high but coming back to normal a few hours later. So the answer here, it's not give more insulin, because you give more insulin, they'll be low here. How can we eliminate these huge spikes after dinner? What are they Raise your hand if you have an idea. Um, well, um, that looks to me like somebody who's not eating right at dinner. Someone who's not eating right at dinner. Well, yeah. Eating right all day, but the wife's obviously a good cook and cooking the wrong thing. Uh, it's, it's the wife's fault. <laughs> that was exactly what I told him. <laughs> See this bump on my head? That... Yeah. Eat the protein first and then the potatoes. Interesting. The order in which we eat things does make a difference. And there was a study published at the ADA scientific sessions last year that showed that if you eat your vegetables, first, before the starchy portion of a meal, it does slow down the blood sugar rise. 
the veggies first, not necessarily the protein, but certainly the veggies. Yeah. Give bolus 30 minutes before. Give the bolus before eating. Yeah, a while before eating. You know, rapid insulin is rapid in name only. They should call it rapider than regular, because that's all it is. When our bodies make insulin, that's rapid. It starts working in seconds, and it's out of our bodies. It's done working in a few minutes. How long does it take rapid insulin to start working? 15 minutes? How long to peak? Four hours. It takes an hour or two to peak, and how long to finish? I mean, that varies, but you know, around four hours, give or take. How, that's not so rapid. Right? So giving the insulin ahead of time is necessary in a lot of cases. And as far as the food goes, potato. potato. White potato is one of the fastest things at raising blood sugar. Next time you're low, just boil yourself a potato. You're not going to wait for that. But in this case, switching to sweet potatoes would probably do the job. Sweet potatoes are a much slower digesting form of carb. But the other ideas are excellent ones too. Those are other things that can be done. This is a woman who's six months pregnant. And during pregnancy, we have to be really, really tight about post-meal sugars. We try to keep them under 140 at the peak, at the high point. That's not easy. She's having issues at breakfast primarily. Rest of the day, she's in her zone. But after breakfast, we got a lot of peaks into the 200s. Now, we're not going to be using any of the other medications. So what we're trying to do with her is have her split her breakfast. The insulin we're taking takes hours to work. There's no rule that says when you eat your breakfast, you have to eat it all at once. You can have a portion of it at breakfast time and have the rest of it at mid-morning. The insulin is still working during that time. And that's a very effective tool for flattening out the post-meal blood sugar levels. And it worked great for her because you know, a lot of women during pregnancy don't have that much of an appetite to eat large meals anyway. So she's having a couple of small pieces of her meal. You still give all of the insulin up front, just don't eat all of the food at one time. Now here's the same woman. Let's look at her basal insulin at night. Her glucose at bedtime is hovering around 100. And by morning, without eating anything at, late at night, her, her blood sugar is up around 150, 160. So what does that mean about her basal insulin at night? It's too low. Basal insulin has one job, one job, and that's to keep the blood sugar stable when there's nothing else affecting it. If there's no bolus working, no food digesting, and no exercise, basal should keep you steady. So thinking back, earlier on I showed you that person with high sugars all night long. They were around 200 straight through the night. What, what do you think now about that person's basal insulin at night? It's actually fine. It's holding steady. That's basil's job. We use boluses to get the sugar where we want it. We use basil to keep it there. So the, the bolus they were taking in the evening was the problem, not the basil. So in her case, with her glucose rising from 1 AM until about 6, we would need to raise her basil starting a couple of hours ahead. We might take her up from about midnight to 5 or 11 to 4. Um, it takes an hour or two for basal changes to start influencing the blood sugars. Here's another look at an overnight basal test. So the glucose levels during the night in this case are starting to drop off. So this person is finding they have to have a snack at bedtime or they'll be low the next morning. That's a snack without bolusing for it. And they're right, because the basal insulin level is set too high. And this is someone who's not on a pump. They're taking Lantus. But when you use Lantus or Levomir, you're taking basal insulin, and you need to get it fine-tuned. The sensor's a great way to do that. If things are not stable overnight, the doses need to be adjusted. Here's somebody on a pump who was having a drop in their blood sugar between about 3 and 6 in the morning. And interestingly, another drop between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. 3 to 6 is just a bad time for this person. But the basal insulin levels leading up to those time frames look like they need adjustment. So the middle of the night, middle of the afternoon basal settings are probably a little bit too high. All right, now let's talk about this insulin action curve. I asked before how many of you, you know, what do you set? How many hours did you set that for in your pump? Four. Four. Anyone else? Three? 
three and a half. They usually get a range anywhere from two to five hours that people set for that. Four is probably the most common setting. The question is, how do you really know what it is? You know, everybody metabolizes insulin at a different rate. You know, you're, you're, you have enzymes in your bloodstream that break it down, your kidneys eliminate it. Everyone breaks down insulin a little bit differently. So if you were to give yourself a correction bolus and kind of watch the curve or look at it the next morning, you'll see how long it took for that blood sugar to level off again and stop dropping. So in this case, we had about a three hour duration of action. This one, we had about a four hour duration. Now this is one that was done over a meal. My preference is to do these on just the correction dose, but you can do it over a meal. In this case, it took about five hours for the blood sugar to officially stop dropping. So this, there's a little longer action curve for this person. It's important that your basal settings are established before you try to test this. Because if your basal rates aren't set right, it's going to affect how long it takes for your blood sugar to finally level off. This is actually a very important number to get right. You know, John Walsh may talk with you a little more about this later. If you underestimate how long it takes for your insulin to work, let's say it really takes five hours and you put in three. Your pump is going to constantly underestimate how much insulin on board you have and it's going to overdose you and you're going to have low after low after low as a result. If you overestimate, if you put in four hours and your insulin only lasts three hours, your pump's going to overestimate how much insulin on board you have. It's going to constantly underdose you and you'll have highs after highs after highs. This is a pretty important number to get right. So if you're using four or three or whatever now, I'd encourage you to test it. You know, use your sensor to test how long your boluses really take to work. This is an example where we were able to figure out why somebody's blood sugars were rising in the early morning hours. This was a college student I work with and she contacted me and said she's having these highs in the morning, wanted to know if she should raise her basal or her bolus or what. And I said, you know, let's look at your sensor data first. And Look what's happening in the middle of the night between you know, 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Every night except one. There was one night that was kind of an outlier, but every night low and then whoosh, rising afterwards. We call that a rebound or a samoji. When we have mild lows like that while we're sleeping, the body starts to generate hormones to counteract it. Sometimes those hormones don't have an effect until hours later. And that's what's making her blood sugar rise later in the morning. So the answer here to fix those morning highs, the answer was less insulin, not more. She needed less insulin in the early part of the night. And I don't remember offhand if it was a snack bolus that we reduced or if it was her basal in the early part of the night. But cutting back on the insulin is the solution. Uh, this is a guy who was starting to use Simlin at meal times to try to control his post-meal peaks. And you can see this was when he was on a very low dose. Uh, the sensor is a great way to figure out what dose is going to work. All right, now before I show you the, the, the dose that worked, I don't want you to get the thought that everyone who uses Simlin gets control like this. But he had really nice control. When we got him up to 60 micrograms, his post-meal peaks were almost non-existent. All right, so that's, <laughs> that's not normal, trust me. All right, and I don't want you to think I have numbers even close to this. Mine bounce around like the top graph almost all the time. Uh, but that was nice to be able to achieve something like that. Now, we also had people who love to experiment. You know who you are. You like to try things and see what works. This was somebody who decided, all right, three days in a row, I'm going to have the same amount of carb, but different types of food, and see what the pattern looks like. You can see the difference it makes. The, the yogurt, the blue line, it was almost flat. Yogurt's a very low glycemic index food. It's got carbs, but they digest very, very slowly. So the insulin is able to cover it much better. Uh, the oatmeal caused a little bit slower rise than the cereal. The cereal is the one that spiked the most. That caused the biggest post-meal peak. So it just it tells you what kind of foods are going to give you better after-meal control. 
And this shows the response that we sometimes have to stress. This was a guy in his 40s, good looking guy, good speaker. And he was on his way to a meeting. He was late for the meeting, got a flat tire on the way to the meeting, took a small snack, and found out the spare was flat too. So you can see the blood sugar rise was about 300 points from that stressful event. Stress is powerful. You've probably seen this yourselves, but to quantify it like that is special. You really learn that stress can impact your blood sugars this much. So you try to learn techniques and strategies for minimizing your stress response. We can't avoid stress, but the way we respond to it, we do have a little bit more control over that. This was an interesting look at different forms of exercise. This was a guy whose basal settings had been established very nicely. And it showed on a night he did a, a light workout from, you know, from midnight until 8 a.m. His blood sugars were relatively flat. That was after he did a light workout the night before. But some nights he would do, he called his double death workout. He really worked hard. And what he was having happen is on those nights, his blood sugar would start to drop when he slept. And we call that delayed onset hypoglycemia. Uh, Sherry Kohlberg will be talking about managing lows and preventing them. That's part of the discussion. But what could he do to prevent that kind of delayed drop in his blood sugar after the double death workouts? Temp basal rate at 50%. Lower the basal. I love this group. Because a lot of times, I'll present to a group and someone will raise his hand and say, hey, he just shouldn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hear that in this audience. That's great. Yeah, for him, being on a pump, he can lower his basal overnight after those hard workouts, which is it's a great way to deal with it. It also helps him keep lean because you know, the less insulin you can take, the less fat your body stores. So that's an ideal solution for him. If he wasn't on a pump, what could we do? You could give less of your long-acting basal insulin, the Lannis or the Levomir which would probably work. The, the trouble with that is now for 24 hours, you've messed up your insulin dosing. What else could you do? A little bit of carb. What if you split the dose? Split which dose? Uh, so if I'm going to work out and I'm on pens, then I'll take one at 7 a.m. and one at 7 p.m. And, and take a different amount. Yeah. Some people find, especially with Levomir, which is a little shorter acting, that if they take two different doses of it, the night dose really is mainly working overnight. So yeah, somebody who's doing that could lower the evening dose of their long acting. But you also mentioned, yeah, have some carbs. You can eat something at bedtime that's very slow to digest, a very low glycemic index thing that'll just give you some slow burning fuel through the night. I'm, personally, I'm not a big fan of these specially formulated low GI bars that they make. I mean, you can have some chocolate at bedtime. It'll do the same thing. <laughs> you know, milk, chocolate milk will do the same thing. I mean, you, you, can, you can use any, just about any kind of normal food that's low GI and get that, get that effect. Here's one more looking at the delayed effects of just lifestyle activities. The Dexcom software uh, and also the old Navigator software would allow us to section out specific days of the week. So you could look at your, all of your Tuesday data on one chart for a month or two months. In this case, we were looking at Saturday night data. This woman had great control in the morning except Sunday morning. So when we looked at her Saturday night data, She's doing pretty nicely. You, know, you got the one outlier, don't worry about that. But pretty nicely through the evening and then up right through the night. Only on Saturdays. All right? What do you think did that? Why do you think that happened? Alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol? Could be. Restaurant food. What about restaurant food would do that? You don't know the carbs. High fat. Who said that? Yeah. It's the fat. It's the fat in the meal. Ironically, alcohol would not raise the blood sugar. Alcohol lowers blood sugar in a delayed manner. It suppresses the liver's normal output of glucose. But the fat in those meals will raise the blood sugar. 
I do a program talking about how to use advanced pump features. And one thing we make very good use of is the temp basal increase for high fat meals. A lot of people will do an extended bolus, which may help a little bit, but what really works well in these situations is raise the basal for eight or ten hours after a high fat meal. It does a nice job of offsetting the rise we get after those. It's not carbs causing this. This is not slowly digesting carbs. This is the effect of fat. These are fatty acids that are causing insulin resistance and making the liver secrete extra glucose. And we offset that with extra basal insulin. It works very nicely. Do you see this with proteins too? Hmm? With protein? Do, you see Do I see it with protein? Generally, no. The only time I see a rise in blood sugar from protein is in people on extremely low carb diets. If you're not eating enough carbohydrate, some of the protein you eat will convert to glucose. A whole other story. But if you're using a CGM, it's a nice way to evaluate when protein kicks in. All right, so then the question is we, we've seen a lot of benefits from these. Why isn't everyone using a CGM? And we still have issues with them. Uh, you know, the costs that are involved, although most health plans now cover them to some extent, except Medicare. Medicare just won't cover them at all. We still get false alarms occasionally. There's some inaccuracy issues and so on. Uh, but uh, there's a few good strategies for minimizing these downsides and helping keep them uh, from affecting you much. Starting out with setting the alerts. I think I mentioned before, Set the alerts conservatively. You don't want them going off constantly. If you're just starting out with a sensor, set your high alert at 300 or higher. You have time. You can gradually pare it down as you get more experience with the system, but don't set it at 180 or 160 when you get started. It's going to go off all the time. When you're setting a predictive alert, set it as short as possible. You know, a long-term predictive alert is like a seven-day weather forecast anywhere but San Diego. <laughs> it just loses value. You know, in the Northeast, in Philly, wherever, you, know, you, can, you can look at the long-term weather forecast and say, all right, one or two days from now, it's somewhat reliable. Four, five, six, seven days from now, it's just a shot in the dark. You go make a sandwich when they give those reports. Uh, but, so with this, the longer out you're trying to predict that you're going to go high or low, the less accurate it is. Keep that duration short. And I, I do like the fall alert. If your sugar is dropping fast, it's good to know. You know, if you're 190 and falling, it's fine. But if you're 120 and falling fast, you may have to act quickly. Uh, skip over this. Calibration, you know, it's essential to keeping the system accurate. Uh, both of them require calibrations at least twice a day. Dexcom will continue working though even if you don't calibrate and a lot of people will calibrate once a day or skip days. You're really setting yourself up for problems if you do that. These systems do tend to drift out of range a bit. The longer you go without calibrating, the less accurate the systems become. And if, you, if you're not finger sticking, it means you're making decisions based on what your sensor shows. So calibrate it. You know, first thing in the morning, always calibrate. Last thing at night, always calibrate. You know, and once or twice in the middle of the day, that's optimal. Now, a lot of people who check their blood sugar meticulously, they check 10, 12 times a day, I don't think it's really necessary if you've got, especially with the Dexcom system, if it's working well, you should be fine checking four times a day and then use the Dexcom between your main meals to give you an idea of where your blood sugar is. Um, make sure that your finger sticks are accurate also. I mean, I'm the worst at this. You know, we get a little bit sloppy with our technique. Someone asked me the other day, you know, when did I last change my Landsat? And I couldn't even, said, what year is this? I don't know. You know it's been a while. Um, the the old Landsat's not that big a deal, but make sure if you have a meter that requires calibration that it's calibrated right. The strips need to be stored properly. They can't be too hot, too cold. Um, make sure your hands are clean, because even it doesn't have to be something sweet. Even dirt on your hands will affect the, or sweat, will affect the accuracy of a reading. And use finger sticks. Uh, alternate site measurements are not as timely. I mean, they're reasonably accurate, but they're not quite as timely as a finger stick, which is a pure capillary blood sample. 
Uh, the sensors themselves, I know they don't require it, but I would suggest keeping your extra sensors refrigerated. There's an enzyme in the sensor. It's a glucose oxidase is the enzyme in the sensor. And the, the warmer they're stored, the faster they decay. You'll get better performance and longer life out of your sensors if they're stored in a cool place. Or you know, in, a, in a cold place is fine, just don't freeze them. It's okay to use sensors a few months past the expiration. Has anyone gone beyond, let's say, three months past the expiration date? Yeah. How's it worked? Um, there's been just a couple of uh, sending out errors that it's out of range. All right, yeah. a few extra errors out of range, okay. Anyone else gone past, more than three months past? I, I got some that were a couple of years past, and <laughs> I actually, it worked um, after the first half of the week, so it would go crazy up and down, and then it started to level out. All right, so she used sensors from the last millennium <laughs> that took a little longer to warm up, and then they seemed to work a little bit better. Well, while we're at it, what's the longest you've gotten out of a sensor? Anyone gotten more than 20 days? Anyone gotten more than 25 days? John, what's the longest you've gotten? Just say start it again? Yes. Really? Did you say 46 days? <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> the sensor companies are really making their dollars worth off of you, aren't they? <laughs> now, typically, the sensors can be used for about two life cycles. So, with Medtronic, six days is not uncommon. With Dexcom, 14 days is not uncommon. But you know, there are some people whose bodies don't break the sensor enzyme down very quickly. It'll keep working for weeks. As long as a sensor is working well and not causing you skin irritation, keep using it. Because every time you start a new sensor, you've got the warm-up period, you've got the break-in time where it's not as accurate, so you might as well keep using one that's functioning. Yeah? I said it's a question, but does, does it last longer if your blood sugars are lower? Oh, does it last longer if your sugars are normal? I have no idea. I don't think so. I mean, I've got clients who have, some of them have high sugars a lot, or low sugars, and they, they've gotten a lot of life out of them. But that'd be interesting to study, wouldn't it? Yeah. I think, I mean, my biggest complaint is adhesive. I would leave it in forever if it didn't rip out before I had to take it out. Yeah. Um, I was yeah. just wondering if yeah, the adhesive, Joe was saying, is one of the challenges to keeping a sensor working for a while. Most people find with the Dexcom, the adhesive will hold pretty well for a week, and then they have to put some, an over bandage, just some tape over the sensor and adhesive to hold it on. And Medtronic, you have to put extra adhesive on from the get-go. And you may have to put extra tape on you know, the longer that you have it, or the more you sweat, or if you spend time in the water, it tends to loosen up more. I have had some people use uh, a substance called mastosol that they'll put uh, like a, make an, a circle of it on their skin, put the sensor through the middle of it, and the mastosol will hold will bond the adhesive bandage to the skin very very tightly, almost indefinitely. It's very strong stuff. Mastisol, M-A-S-T-I-S-O-L. Hmm? Yeah, they make stuff called Detachol for removing it. <laughs> it's pretty strong. Site selection is an issue. Uh, we learned long ago that these sensors work well in flabby parts of the body. This is an audience that doesn't have a lot of flabby parts to their body, so we have to pick our sites carefully. Uh, even though you know, these systems are you know, technically FDA approved for use on the abdomen or the arm. They work fine, just about any body part. So the outer thigh can work well, the upper buttocks, the lower back, any place you can get a little bit of a fat pad, they should work fine. So don't feel like you have to stick with the manufacturer's recommendation for sites. Uh, those still using a Medtronic system, uh, there's something called a wetting time. Not like marriage wetting, this is wet ting, getting wet. The sensor needs a lot of time to get acclimated to being under the skin before it'll start generating reliable data. My recommendation with the Medtronic sensors is put them in your body the night before you actually start using them and linking them to the pump. Uh, that way they have adequate time to you know, 
get some fluid movement and get working well. You know, I thought about doing that with the Dexcom too. I did it for a while. Mm -hmm. Put it on in the night and then don't press start till the morning. So he uh, put some Dexcom sensors on the night before and hit, you know, start sensor the next morning. Did you see any difference in the sensor performance? It seemed almost exactly the same. Yeah, most people find after two hours they do start to work pretty well. Uh, inserting the sensors, uh, we see a little more bleeding with the Medtronic because it's a larger introducer needle. It's not that common to see bleeding with the Dexcom sensor. A little bit of bleeding is not harmful or dangerous and it won't affect the sensor. Profuse bleeding is a problem though. You know, once in a while, we're like that. We're pin cushions. We hit, uh, we hit a blood vessel once in a while with pump sites, with sensors. And who here has never had a gusher? We all know what those are. <laughs> it's just bad luck. We just hit a blood vessel when we did that. Um, but if you do get a lot of bleeding, take the sensor out, hold the cloth over it until the bleeding stops. Uh, adhesive we talked about, the signal reception. Now this is interesting. You know, when Dexcom's G4 came out, we knew right away that that was going to help because the transmitter is just so much more powerful. Now you can be 20, 30, 40 feet away from your receiver, it'll still pick up the signal. And that's great for parents of children or for spouses or loved ones because you can have the receiver in another part of the house and it's still picking up a signal. Or you can be on a playing field and someone on the sideline can still see your data. Medtronic doesn't have that kind of power in its transmitter. It, it goes up at the most five or six feet and there are times you could be wearing it, you're two feet from it and it's still not picking up. So they came up with a system where that picks up the signal and amplifies it. So this would be plugged in, let's say, at your bedside. It amplifies the signal and sends it all over the house, and it, the signal picks up on like an alarm clock device. So Medtronic has this at their booth that you can look at if you want. And it really is just an alarm clock. It has a radio receiver, it displays numbers, and it makes noise if there's a problem. It's, a, it's an alarm clock. So if you went to Target, how much would an alarm clock cost? Five bucks. Five bucks, ten bucks, fifteen, twenty. These are two thousand dollars. A lot of medical testing and things that go into it. But you do have that option with theirs. So overall, what we found ingredients for success is the last thing I'll show you. Uh, and this is from discussions I've had with some, some of the better clinicians around the country who do a lot of work with CGM. Go into it with the right expectations. You still need to finger stick. It's got to be calibrated. You got to know when your sensor is reliable and know when it's not and finger stick when it's not. Make sure you're calibrating properly, uh, putting accurate calibration data in in a timely way. That's big, big for improving the performance. When you start using a system, cut down on the nuisance alarms. You know, just use the high alert at a very high level, the low alert at a reasonable level, and that's it. Um, wear it continuously. There are there's multiple studies that have been done that show that people who use a CGM just once in a while really don't get the same kind of benefits. Uh, people who use them on an ongoing, regular basis, we see better A1Cs, we see fewer bouts of hypoglycemia, and, and reported better quality of life. So that's what it's meant to be used for. When you're wearing one, it's a good idea to look at it maybe once an hour. That's good timing. Uh, you don't have to be overly obsessive with it. If you're looking at it constantly and sweating about what's happening and making constant adjustments, you might do more harm than good. And don't ignore it either. You put it on, don't just put it on and not look at it all day long. Uh, react to the data in an intelligent way. You know, particularly when your sugar is elevated and you need more insulin, always take insulin on board into account. And if you're going to make adjustments to your set program, uh, don't base it on one day's events. I wouldn't even base it on two or three days events because we know how often things change. Look at general patterns and that's something you can do when you download to the various software packages. And if you do need additional help looking at the info, feel free to get in touch with my practice. We can you know, work with you long distance on that type of thing. I had a few things on the back table. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet if you'd like to get the newsletter that our practice puts out. It's an e-newsletter. Be more than happy to add all of you to the list if you like. 
Um, there's some information on the coaching services that we offer. And those of you who have not used CGM who want to try one, we have a loaner service. So if you wanted to give one a try, we could set that up. All right, so after lunch, we'll have Cliff Sherb in here talking about uh, the gadgets, and then John will be talking about advancements in pump therapy. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Yeah. You mentioned that the different finger stick uh, devices have different accuracies. In your mind, which one is the more accurate one, especially for those using the new Great question. Which are the more accurate blood glucose meters? I kind of lump them together. We have older generation, we have newer generation. So the newer generation systems that are among the more accurate ones, uh, the Bayer Contour Next, the Vario from J and J, uh, the AccuCheck Nano. Those are the three I would put in the the new generation systems with the best accuracy. Yeah, when you came up with that A1C, that twenty eight point six, what's that number? Oh, where did that those numbers come from? There, there's a, an equation. It's called an EAG, estimated average glucose, based on A1C levels. Right. It's, it's like pi when you're doing geometry. It's just a formula that, that's used to interpret it. Gary, uh, for the pre-fat meal adjustment of the basal, what percentage would you increase it? Oh, Charlie, it, it, it is trial and error. I, I know that if I have a lot of pizza, one slice isn't going to affect things much, but if I eat a lot of pizza, I have to raise my basil by about 60% for the next eight hours. Movie theater popcorn, which is my kryptonite, I can't avoid the stuff. I have to double my basil for the next 12 hours. I get the big bucket with the refill. It's good stuff. And if my wife tries to get any, I'm like, mm. What would you do if you're on? If you're on injections and you need to make adjustments for fat, interestingly, you can go back to using a little bit of NPH to do the same kind of thing. NPH, you know, it's what the not particularly helpful insulin, but it, it, it does have some practical uses and that's one of them. You take a little bit of NPH to offset the fat in the meal, it does a nice job. What about yeah. combo bolus? Well, if you're on, as she said, if you're on injections. Okay. Yeah. Is that a, what is that? What is NPH? NPH is an older insulin that we had bef it was it was the long acting insulin before Lantus and Levomir. It it has a it's about a 10 to 12 hour action to most people, but it's not very consistent and predictable. It's got a mind of its own. Do you think Levomir has a peak? Levomir has a peak? Absolutely. Yeah. Levomir, and Atlantis has a little bit of a peak too. And it, again, it's different from person to person. I don't think there's any injectable insulin that's truly peakless. In some people, it's a more significant peak than others. You just have to try it and see. Hmm. A question. Um, when you said the, the 50 point uh, correction for mm -hmm. your blood sugar, uh, when you have is it two arrows going up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adjusting for direction arrows, rate of change arrows. If there's two arrows, then adjust for a 50 point blood sugar change. And one arrow, 25. Where did I get that number? I just, <laughs> it just seems to work. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.